You already own chickens. What is the next animal that you should get? Should you start raising pastured poultry to make money? And how do you get water to an already existing barn or outbuilding? We're gonna answer those questions and a whole lot more in today's episode of Ask Homestead. Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of Ask Home Study. This is the weekly show where we sit down and we answer the questions that you've left on our channel from this week's previous videos. If you want to get a question answered on Ask Home Study, it's not too difficult. All you have to do is leave a question on our YouTube channel in one of the previous week's videos. So starting today, Friday, uh, this video, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, any of those videos, leave a question, but don't forget Two things, I'm gonna ask you to do two things today. First, put the hashtag AskHomestudy. That way when I sit down to do this, I can find your question. It helps me help you. And the second thing I'm gonna ask you to start working on if you're leaving questions is to give as much detail as you can in your question. We have a couple questions today that we're gonna to get to that I think I could do a better job answering if I had more details. So don't forget the hashtag AskHomestudy and give us some detail as to the situation that you want an answer to. And that way we have a better chance of helping all of you who are watching. Let's jump right in. We have really good questions this week. The first question that we have is from Charles Feely. He asks a question that I just thought was so good because we often get asked, what is the first animal that I should bring onto my homestead? We don't often get asked, what is the next one? Charles says, I have five acres and I just started with chickens. He has some Rhode Island Reds. My plan is to become more self-sufficient and I've started my long pantry. What animal should I prepare to start raising next? Charles, you sound like a smart guy. Not only are you starting to work on your preparedness, your self-reliance and your self-sufficiency, but you're already planning ahead for the next animal. And I wanted to encourage you and anybody in your position who has just started with one animal to do just what you're doing. Start with one animal, plan for the next one by all means, but don't jump into a second animal because each new animal brings its own set of problems. It starts its own fires that you have to put out. It's much easier to master one animal and then move on to the next one. So good on you for getting just one and planning ahead. Now, when eventually the time comes, you want to get more livestock and you specifically mention the idea of becoming more self-sufficient. I wanted to point out the difference between self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and why that is important with your goals. So you've started a long pantry. I'm assuming what you mean by a long pantry is like what I would refer to as a deep pantry, a pantry where you put lots of supplies. If every week you cook mac and cheese, then you have five boxes deep of mac and cheese. Uh, if every week you, you know, eat trail mix, you have bags of trail mix, deep pantry. That is great, that is self-reliance. In a hard time, you would be able to rely on the food that you have there and it would last you however long your deep pantry was. As far as your homestead goes, you talk about the goal of wanting to be more self-sufficient. The definition of self-sufficiency, and I'm gonna read this so I get it exactly right, <clears throat> needing no outside help in satisfying one's basic needs, especially with regard to food production. So self-sufficiency, it's a word that gets thrown around all the time in the homesteading and the small-scale agricultural world. Uh, lots of people want to be self-sufficient. Some people talk about being totally self-sufficient, off-grid, growing all their own food. And it's an awesome idea. Imagine if we had a property where we were raising enough food and enough animals and getting our own energy. It's a great thing to strive for even if I personally believe it's impossible. <laughs> I don't think anybody can be 100% self-sufficient. When you look at homesteaders back in the 1800s when the Homesteading Act came out, homesteaders who moved west and lived off the land, even they didn't do 100% of their own thing. You can read the Little House on the Prairie series. Here's a family who moved out west, they were homesteading, but oftentimes you'll read about Pa going to get work at a local farm to get a little extra money that he would then go and buy supplies like sugar. I mean, you're not gonna grow your own sugar if you live in uh, the northern climate. 
and chances are you probably like sugar. So the point is, self-sufficiency is a great goal to have, a great goal to work towards. If we never get there, we'll still be in a better place when, than when we started working towards it. So Charles, good on you for wanting to be more self-sufficient. My usual second animal recommendation is going to change here because of the fact that you specifically mentioned wanting to be self-sufficient. Self-sufficient means you don't need to rely on outside inputs to produce what you have. Egg-laying chickens oftentimes will be getting fed outside inputs. However, if times got tough, if the grid shut down, if all you could do was grow your own chickens off of what was on your property, you probably could get by and have chickens that produced eggs. Maybe they wouldn't produce as many eggs as they're currently producing on an egg-laying ration or an egg-laying feed. But if you were able to supplement their winter diet with some bugs, maybe some protein sources, things that you didn't eat, you know, you kill an animal and you give them the stuff you don't want to eat, they could probably make it year-round laying eggs. Chickens are one of the better self-sufficiency options that are not ruminants. So what would I suggest for you? Oftentimes when people say, what's the second animal I should get? I don't get asked this a lot, like I said, but if I do get asked it, I would oftentimes say pigs. I love pigs, they're great for homesteaders, they're a great way to put meat on the table and in the freezer. But pigs are heavy, heavy consumers. They need a lot of protein to get to the point where you can actually butcher them. And pigs are not ruminants. Their body is not designed to turn grass into animal meat, protein. Pigs' digestive systems are a lot more like humans than they are a cow or a goat. Pigs are omnivores. They'll eat a dead carcass if they find it. They will eat grass. They will eat lettuce. They will eat donuts. But pigs do need a lot of protein. They need a high input. So while I love raising pigs and I think they're a great second animal, if your goal is self-sufficiency, not bringing in outside inputs onto your homestead wherever possible, then a pig would be a bad choice because I always recommend people buy a good quality pig feed if they're going to raise pigs. That is the best, healthiest, just all around good operating procedure when you're raising pigs. So what would I suggest? Well, a ruminant would be a much better option if your goal is self-sufficiency, assuming that you live somewhere where you can grow grass lots of the year. So this is one of those examples. I wish I knew a little bit more about where you live, Charles. If I knew you lived in the tropics and you could grow grass, you know, 11 months out of the year, then I might suggest a certain kind of ruminants. Whereas, you know, if you live in the northern climate and it's colder, you know, you have to put hay up for ruminants and chances are you're not producing your own hay on five acres. It's probably not enough land to get a bigger ruminant like a cow taken care of year round. It's, it's definitely not. <laughs> so what ruminant would be the right second animal for you? Five acres with self-sufficiency is your goal, not bringing inputs in from the outside world or as little as possible. You're probably in the world of sheep or goats. So which of the two do I suggest for a beginner? I think personally sheep have a bit more of a learning curve. Sheep are more susceptible to worms than any other livestock. The combination of how they eat, they'll eat grass right down to the roots and they'll eat all over where they poop. It's a bad combination for worms. Certain times of the year they can get hit pretty hard. And while I could suggest to you that you just raise a feeder lamb and not have sheep on your property year round so you don't have to worry about the worm load, that's not really self-sufficient. Self-sufficient means you bring a pair of breeders onto the farm and you keep breeding and you have your own little flock and you have them year round. No matter what happens, you have meat, uh, maybe even milk on your homestead. So I'm gonna sideline sheep and focus in on goats now. Goats, as I talked about recently, Nubian goats are my favorite go-to dual purpose homestead animal. They produce lots of meat. Bucks can get upwards of 160 pounds. Does can produce a gallon of milk a day. And they can do this off of what might be less quality pasture compared to like cow pasture. They can turn weeds and leaves and sticks and browse into milk and meat. 
they are oftentimes does will have twins. So now you talking about self-sufficiency, you take a breeding pair, a doe and a buck, and ideally maybe two does and a buck, and every year they can have each of those does for combined four does somewhere around there. Some goats I've seen have triplets. Uh, I wouldn't expect it every time, especially from a larger like a Nubian, but you'll definitely get twins. Uh, so self-sufficiency wise, they're going to give a lot. You're going to get meat, you're going to get milk, and goats are a little bit more forgiving on the learning curve when it comes to infrastructure, uh, moving animals, breeding animals. They're a bit easier to handle than cows anyway. In five acres, I probably wouldn't suggest that you do cows anyway as well. So goats are a good option. I like the Nubian goats for dual purpose, but don't make the mistake of getting into dairy goats if you're not into dairy goats, uh, or if you're not into the idea of doing dairy. So if you're like me, and you don't like the idea of milking an animal, then you'd be better off getting some meat goats. And a good breed for meat goats, boar goats are the go-to breed for meat goats. If you want a more hands-off approach, Kiko goats are the better meat goat if you don't want to be super hands-on trying to nurse them along. Nubian goats will produce good meat, but they're not going to do as good as like a boar. So that's a good option. If you like the idea of dairy and not the idea of meat, you could also go with Nigerian dwarfs. They're not going to produce a lot of milk. You can expect a good line of Nigerian to give like two quarts a day. If you're low milk consumers, again, I wish I knew a little bit more how many people you're trying to feed. Do you have kids? Do you have a family? That sort of thing. Um, if you're not large milk consumers, then maybe a Nigerian dwarf, a couple does and a little buck would be another good option. You're not going to want them for meat, but they'll produce milk. So that's nice. That's a nice additional thing if you like the idea of milking every day. Again, that's kind of a personality thing. If you like mil every morning doing the same thing, you know, as many months of the year as you're in milk, well, then that's a good option. If you don't like the idea of dairy and goats even sound maybe too big, I was talking about this with Kay and she had another good suggestion. You could go the route of rabbits. You already have chickens, so you're familiar with basic livestock care. Meat rabbits are a nice option and they're small if you only have a little acreage. I mean, five acres you can do lots with and I don't wanna say five acres is small, but if you're just getting started and goats seem like too much, rabbits would be a good secondary animal for meat. You can get meat rabbits. Now you still need to feed rabbits. Meat rabbits are fed a pellet, a protein source. However, as you know, look outside. Rabbits live in the wild the meat rabbits you get will not become big fat meat rabbits off of wild forage nor is it easy to free range rabbits in the wild you have to contain them they're not a tame animal that are easy to move about but if you're looking for more self-sufficiency knowing you'll never be 100 percent self-sufficient meat rabbits that you're growing in your own backyard are good and you can supplement their diet with lots of greens, lots of your own, whatever you're growing from your garden, the grass and that sort of thing. So I hope that helps Charles. Again, narrow it down to maybe meat rabbits or maybe a dual purpose Nubian goat or if you're afraid of the bigger goats, you could try the Nigerian dwarfs. The goal of self-sufficiency is a great goal. Continue pushing towards it. The less outside inputs you need to get by, the better off you and your family will be during tough times, the better quality your food will be, period, the more enjoyable. But don't be afraid to source what you need locally. While maybe you'll never be able to raise a pig without buying a pig feed, it doesn't mean you can't find a local farm growing and grinding their own pig feed. And homesteaders from the very beginning of the Homesteading Act, even modern day, people who live that homestead life, we live in an area with lots of Mennonites, they all work together in a community. They work together, one person has a feed shop, one person's growing corn and potatoes and, and this other crop, these people have livestock. It's not wrong to source locally the things you need that you can't do yourself. So I hope you, I hope you enjoy raising your next animal and uh, let us know what you pick if you do pick one of those animals. This worked really nicely as a next question. Somebody wanted to know about rabbits. So the next question here is, if I can pull it up, 
John. John says, would rabbits be worth it for small scale, sorry, would rabbits be worth it for a small production scale? And would, and then he asked a question about turkeys and guineas. We're gonna focus on the rabbit question today, John. Would rabbits be worth it for a small production scale? I'm assuming, again, question's a little bit vague, John. I'm assuming when you say a small production scale, you're using the word production because you're thinking about turning this into like a business. Uh, you could be just saying, are, small, are rabbits good for small scale meat production for my family? In which case, I can't, what I just said to Charles would apply to you, yes. Rabbits are a nice way to feed your family your own meat. You'll have to get some rabbit feed pellets, but you know, some basic simple infrastructure, rabbit hutches, or building like a warren system. Rabbits reproduce like rabbits, so you can have a buck and a doe and they can give you lots more rabbits. And rabbit's delicious, it's easier to process if you're doing your own processing compared to like chickens. You don't have to pluck rabbits, you skin them. Typically the way a rabbit is butchered is its neck is broken, it is then bled out, opened up, gutted. The uh, As far as taking the hide off goes, that's a quick movement. You cut a few little cuts and then you pull it off like a glove. So rabbits are a nice option for small scale meat production. We've never done them. We've always stuck to the chicken side of things because we have the chicken infrastructure. You can't put rabbits in a chicken coop. You need a rabbit hutch or if you're gonna put them out on grass, some sort of way to contain them. Some people build a warren system. A rabbit warren is like tunnels into the ground, but then you need to make sure that's fenced and that you can get the rabbits when you need them. But if you're interested in raising your own meat and you want to, especially for those of you who will butcher it yourself, I think rabbits are a better option than DIY homestead chickens because the butchering is easier if you don't already have the infrastructure for chickens like we do. We already have the chicken infrastructure, so we just keep doing meat chickens. But now, I believe from your question, and I'm just gonna assume that you're also talking about small production to make money. That when I hear the word production, I think about like producing for money. And I could be wrong, but we're gonna talk about it anyway. So like anything in life, uh, smaller production is hard to make financially viable. That's why when you look at businesses that are successful, it's because of the volume and the bulk of what they're doing. If every year you raise 10 rabbits, it's going to be hard to cover your costs and, and make any kind of profit. Let's, let's zoom in, right? You're gonna raise one group of, of rabbits, and this could apply to, actually we'll talk about this in a minute, chickens, but if we zoom in, uh, if we raise 10 rabbits, well, we need infrastructure for rabbits. We need fencing, we need to get feed. Uh, we need, we have some reoccurring costs. If we're doing this as a business, maybe we wanna have some storage space, some freezer space, probably some insurance if we're selling people food. We're gonna open up an LLC so we can't get sued. The minute you become a business, all these additional costs show up. And if you're only selling 10 rabbits, you have to incorporate these costs, infrastructure, feed, uh, insurance, all those things have to be factored into the amount of rabbits you're selling. So if you're only selling 10 rabbits and your, inf in your insurance every year is $1,000, that's $100 per rabbit. That's not gonna work. So small production, really small, does not work well. It works much better when we grow our production. But that's not to say small scale farm production can't work. You just have to be really, really good. I rarely, rarely would advise someone uh, to get into small scale farming, especially more like homestead size farming to make money. Uh, what we have learned from a decade of this is it's very hard to make money as a farmer. It's very hard, you have to be really good, really smart, really driven to actually succeed. And when you're doing it at a very small like homestead level, just enough for you, your family, and a couple friends, you're not gonna profit. But if your goal is to cover the cost of what you're doing, well you might be successful at that. So let's say I know my family every year is going to eat a rabbit a week. So I need 50 rabbits. And I have no idea how much money I'm gonna spend on 50 rabbits because I've never raised rabbits, but I've done this with chickens. 
So if I'm gonna raise 50 rabbits for myself, I need to put in water lines to get water to my rabbits. I need to have some kind of hutch system for my rabbits. I need the processing equipment. You know what, if I double it, and off of every rabbit, I can take the whole cost of the rabbit, add a 30% to that for my profit, well now th this starts to work. So if I raise twice as many rabbits as I need, and I can make a 30% profit off of that other major, that other half of the rabbits, over a couple years time that will help defray the amortized costs of my infrastructure, my water lines, my hutches, and eventually I could be profitable doing that. And this is the exact way that we were able to make raising pigs worthwhile back at Squash Hollow Farm. Every year we needed two for our family, but to have two pigs I needed fencing, I needed water lines, everything I talked about. I wanted insurance on my livestock, I wanted to run the business. So in my two pigs, in addition to those two, I would raise another six, seven, eight, nine. One year we raised 12 pigs total to cover the costs of my own two pigs. And it worked out where if I sold six pigs and I raised two for my family, the six pigs would cover the cost of my two. I wouldn't profit any money, I wasn't earning anything for my time, but all the expense in feeding my family two pigs was covered in selling these six additional pigs. So you definitely could do that with something small scale like rabbits if the goal is to produce enough food for your family and cover the costs. The numbers will vary depending on what you're doing. Uh, and then you just have to ask yourself, is there a market for rabbits where you are? Are people familiar with eating rabbit? Do they already buy it at the farmer's market? If not, can you make one? Are you a driven person who can convince someone that rabbit is a meat that they're missing out on and they should be eating. <laughs> and if you're that kind of person, then you can make rabbits worthwhile. And uh, I hope that you do. If you do, let us know. Because it's a great way to feed your family and cover the costs. Very similar question, but different animal. So we'll get to that one next. Simple Man says, oh, not Simple Man, sorry, different question here. Uh, Robbie, do pasture-raised chickens make a profit, or are they a waste of time? Robbie, I have bad news for you. Pasture-raised chickens, they like to eat, they make a lot of poop, they never make a profit. They are not interested in money whatsoever. Okay, haha, -ha. I know. You, however, can make profit, you can make money off of pastured poultry. I've done it in the past. I have a really good friend who's really good at it. And my buddy John Siskovich from Farm Marketing Solutions. Uh, he is a farmer in Kent, Connecticut who for years has been running a profitable pasture poultry business. And John, thankfully, has been documenting his profitable pasture poultry business. He wrote books on it. He has what's called the Pastured Poultry Packet, number one. Number two is also out. Uh, pastured Poultry Packets are designed to help you not only raise your own pastured poultry for your family, but raise enough and run a business with the help of the Pastured Poultry Packet, number two. And it helps you with marketing and driving sales and all sorts of things. So I'll have a link below. It's an amazing resource. John's, he puts a ton of time, a ton of effort into his products and his pasture poultry packets are great. I've been through them, I've used them. Last year, some of you, if you watched our chicken videos, you saw me using the pasture poultry packet to set up my, my chicken infrastructure, uh, to plan my year out. Uh, John is really good at walking you through the specifics of pasture poultry. So, yes, you can make money. Now, if your number one goal in life is to make money, if you're sitting down today, you have a full-time job and you're trying to make money on the side, well, I would not suggest you go to pasture poultry to do that. Become an Uber driver, deliver pizzas. Uh, are you handy? Become a handyman and you know, moonlight, do side jobs. There are a lot of better ways to make money than small scale agriculture and small scale farming. It is, like I mentioned in this question about rabbits, it is hard to make profit from livestock, from plants, from food. 
you can look at farmers, there are many farmers who are struggling, there are many farmers who don't make a very good living, uh, but it can be done. John has a really good video where he talks about his numbers, uh, breaking down his pasture poultry numbers. Again, link below to John's information, his pasture poultry packet. Uh, but basically what you have to do, if you want to profit from your pasture poultry operation, you have to track all your expenses. This doesn't mean feed for your chickens and purchasing chickens if you're going to purchase chickens like Cornish crosses. That's part of your costs, but you have to factor in all your costs. So when you get your chickens, they're going to be little and you're going to need heat lamps. And those heat lamps run off electricity. And trust me, when you're running three, four, five heat lamps 24 seven for a couple weeks or months, there's a lot of money that goes into that. Your building that you put the chickens in, is it a chicken coop that you bought? Did it cost a thousand dollars? Over the next five years that you're gonna do pastured poultry, you gotta cover the expense of that building in each year's pastured poultry endeavor. That doesn't mean you need to make a thousand dollars off your first batch of chickens, but you amortize the cost over time. So if you know over the next couple years you're going to raise a thousand chickens to sell and the coop cost you a thousand dollars add an additional dollar to each one of your chicken price to make sure you cover that infrastructure water lines have you installed water electric whatever you need to get started needs to be tracked and covered in the cost and the pastured poultry packet walks you through all of that it helps you do the math per bird I can't say enough good things about it so uh, do pastured raised chickens make a profit? John in his video was able to make nine dollars per chicken profit after factoring in an hourly wage to take care of his chickens, all the expenses including electricity, in the birds, the time spent with the birds, the labor, everything he, he figured it all out, he was able to make nine dollars per bird. Now John lives I know this because he used to be my neighbor. He lives in Connecticut. He sells to one of the wealthier groups of people in the whole United States, people who live in Southern Connecticut. They have a lot of money. They work in the city. They commute back to Greenwich and to Norwalk or wherever they are. Uh, they can afford to spend 25 or $30 on a chicken. And that's good because a pasture raised chicken back when I was in Connecticut what it cost me and what you'll see in John's video is around $20 to produce that chicken so you have to sell the chicken for 25 or $30 is the people where you live are they gonna pay 25 or $30 for a chicken if you say no definitely not there's no way they're going to do that well I have some good news if you live in a less well-off area a less expensive part of the United States or of the whole world, I don't know where you live exactly, or I don't know where you live, period, um, your cost might be less. Maybe the land is cheaper. Maybe feed is cheaper. I have seen a big change in feed prices moving from Connecticut to Pennsylvania. Hay might be cheaper. All your inputs could be cheaper where you live, which means you wouldn't have to ask 30 or $25 per bird. You could maybe ask 20 or 15 per bird. But you won't know that unless you track all your expenses. So you have to be really good about paying attention to all the expenses, all the inputs. If you're not naturally really good at that, get the pasture poultry packet one and two, because one and two will help you with all your inputs and how to build profit into that. If you're naturally good at that, you can set yourself up a spreadsheet and take care of it yourself. Well, go for it. Put yourself a spreadsheet, track all your feed, all your expenses, buying the birds, getting the birds there, the hours you spend, give a dollar per hour rate. Uh, John factored in 12 bucks an hour for his labor costs. Whatever, whatever inputs are going into these chickens, you need to make sure that is covered in the price of the bird. And then you need to be able to sell that bird, covering the costs and profiting. So if it costs you $20 per bird, you need to at least be asking 25 maybe closer to 30 per bird. If you don't think you can get that, if you're not good enough at marketing your product and convincing people that it's worth that, then yes, pastured poultry would be a complete waste of your time. Not necessarily if you do it to feed your own family and uh, give your own family the best quality food that you can. 
if your goal is to feed your family, well then no, they're not a waste of time. You can feed your family cheaper than you could probably buy pastured poultry at your local farmer's market. Uh, so it's good quality food, you're feeding your family, and if you sell a couple extra doing that, well, you're happy getting a little extra money. But if your number one goal is to make money off of farming because you like being outside, maybe you like working in the dirt and you think, I could do this pasture poultry thing, it will be a waste of time if you don't track your expenses, account for all of them, and make sure you build them into the cost, and then ask what you need to ask. Doesn't matter if your neighbor's selling them cheaper, doesn't matter if they're cheaper at the farmer's market. If it costs you $20 to raise a chicken, like it cost me back in Connecticut, you better ask 25 or 30. And if you're not, then it's a total waste of time. So don't waste your time, figure out your expenses. And the best way to do that, I'm guessing uh, because you asked us a simple man, uh, nope, sorry, not simple man, uh, Robbie, uh, you asked us, do they make a profit or are they wasted time? I'm guessing you probably haven't raised them yet. So the thing I would suggest to you go out and raise 10 of them and track your expenses on 10. Raising 100 will cost you less per bird than those 10. So if you raise 10 and you can do it for $15 or $10, then you probably got a good shot at making some money off of pasture poultry. If you raise 10 and you can't do it for less than $25, well you better live somewhere where people have a lot of money and be a really driven businessman. Because if they're costing you a lot to produce, they're probably going to not be able to be marketed too well. I hope that helps and uh, I do like raising pastured poultry. One of my favorite things to do on the homestead is raise meat. I like raising pigs and I like raising meat chickens. Those are my things, my favorite things to raise. We don't have them on this homestead right now because my wife loves the dairy thing, my kids like the goats and the chickens, and when it comes down to it, I can say no to the things I like to do for the sake of them being happy. I still get to do plenty of other things I enjoy on this homestead, like go hunting and fishing, which we're gonna talk about in the next question, which is all about how to profit from the land all around you. Now we're gonna get to Simple Man's question, and it too is about profiting but in a little bit more flexible terms. So Simple Man says, how much product, food, and or income do you use from the f natural land? I feel this is a very underlooked area of the homestead. I live in Northern Pennsylvania. Howdy neighbor. <laughs> a large free or mostly free addition to my homestead sustainability is from nature. I hunt deer, rabbits, grouse, and squirrel. I gather morel mushrooms, berries, Jerusalem artichokes, transplant for better harvest, and ginseng from my land. And probably my biggest cost savings comes from heating my house and water from firewood. For me, this accounts for thousands of dollars in a year in savings and sales. I actually commented back to Simple Man. I said, I don't know if you're a new viewer, Simple Man, but any viewer who's been watching through this last fall knows that I love, 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 love getting food from the natural land. I am a big hunter. But this question is a lot more than just hunting. We're not going to just talk about hunting here. We're going to talk about how, yeah, the natural land, if you live in the United States, not everywhere in the United States, but most of the places, the natural land is rich. One of the things that made the United States so valuable when people found it was the quality of this land to grow good crops. They might not have found gold right away, but they found it in the form of corn growing there. I mean, just you can grow all kinds of plants. There's wildlife. It is a land that you could live off of if it is the way you first stumbled upon it back when the first settlers first stumbled upon it. And I think it's really smart for a homesteader, even in our day and age, to take advantage of the natural land. There's a concept, maybe you've heard of, uh, asymmetrical warfare. So what's asymmetrical warfare? Asymmetrical warfare is where two people are fighting, but not in the traditional sense of like two armies that are, we'll say fist A and fist B here are two armies. Bum, bum, bum. They're marching at each other and they, they clash in the battle and they have this 
duke it out battle and guys swinging swords. That's not asymmetrical. That's a symmetrical warfare. Two big armies clash on a battlefield and one of them wins because they're a little bit better, their strategy's a little bit better, maybe they have more advanced weaponry, they had the better ground. <clears throat> symmetrical warfare. What is asymmetrical warfare? Asymmetrical warfare is here's your big army number one and then here's this little army that uses some kind of technology or some kind of strategy to take advantage. They, they use something different that winds up defeating the bigger army because they used something whether you, or not it was fair. <laughs> uh, maybe natural land formation turns this big army into they all have to go single file and you know that battle of the 300. Oh, the, the point is I like to look at the homestead and figure out how can I wage an asymmetrical battle <laughs> but not in a negative way like in a good way. How can I win when I'm looking at my homestead and the production we're doing without having to match one army to the other. What can I do? Less work, bigger results. Asymmetrical warfare. I hope that illustration was a good one. Let's get into what it means as a homesteader. Every day to produce milk from a cow, we have to go out twice a day. We have to check on the cow, water it, we have to feed it. We have to make sure there's hay in the hayloft, nice and dry, all winter long. That means putting up that hay. That costs money or equipment or time, whatever you do to get your own hay, there's cost there. So we have to put a lot of effort in there, getting it there. Then we have to throw it back down and feed it to her, and she's gonna consume that. We have to clean out stalls. We have to take care of the cow. Kay has to, every day for a, a you know gallon of milk, spend about 45 minutes on the milking going out and milking. So you can see that's a symmetrical battle. There's a ton of time, effort, money, and in the other side there's production in the form of milk and meat in the form of male bull calves or female calves that we can then sell. So it's kind of like a lot of time, effort in, way, and then a lot of good stuff out of it, but it's symmetrical. It's good to have some of those on the homestead. They keep us busy. We enjoy doing them. But now, let's look at the example of hunting. This year, let's not talk about my archery season because that was pitiful. <laughs> let's talk about my gun season. I went out three days, three days, three gun hunts. The first one, the morning got rained out. It was just a bad morning. The second morning I went out, I arrived to the spot I was going to hunt. I got out of the car, there was a deer, off goes the rifle, down she goes. 50, 60 pounds of organic, amazing, awesome quality venison in the freezer. If you were to purchase that quality of meat at the farmer's market, it would cost you 10, 15, 20 dollars per pound, depending on which cuts we're talking about and where you were buying it. So let's say even at 10 dollars per pound, one deer, that's 50 pounds of meat, is a safe number for a doe. That's gonna be $500 worth of meat that went into my freezer. It took me, if you factor day one and day two, it took me about four hours. If you just count that one hunt I went on, it took me like five minutes. That one bullet was not that expensive. The one bullet probably cost a dollar or less. And the time I spent to butcher the deer, it took me probably a day between taking care of the gutting, hanging, and then cutting it up, and then vacuum sealing and everything, so another day. So in about a day and a half, you know, eight, just, we'll say, we'll call it 10 hours just for the sake of easy math. In 10 hours, we put $500 worth of meat into the freezer for my family to enjoy. It's like getting paid $50 an hour, or, or getting $50 an hour out of doing something I love to do. So yeah, that totally checks out. And hunting is not, hunting deer is not the only way you can get profit, get income, get food from the natural world around you. When you think about what we get for the effort we spent, that one gun hunt versus what we got from it, asymmetrical, little bit of effort, lot of bit of value and reward here. 
and that can happen in other ways. If you know a good fishing hole, at the beginning of trout season, you go out opening morning and you limit out, you got your fishing pole already, you already own that, you buy a little, this is what I do every year for opening day for trout. I take my kids, I buy a package of hooks that's like $3, I buy a little thing of worms that's like another $2 or if the ground is soft enough we find our own. We go to a good hole that we know there's a lot of trout in and my son limits and my daughter limits and I limit and we go home with 15 trout. And 15 trout, if you value that at what you, you, know, you spend at the store, we actually did this on a Homesteady podcast episode. We broke down fishing and Accountant Mike valued six trout for me opening morning at about $10 per fish. $60 worth of fish, uh, you know, if I bring my son and my daughter, I mean, you're talking $100, $200 worth of fish in a day or two, throw them in the freezer, and boom. A little bit of time, a little bit of effort, doing something you love, and a lot of value back. And the best part about it, when you're taking advantage of the natural land around you, whether it's hunting or fishing or foraging, you don't have to do any of the other work. If you like to forage, if you like taking walks in the woods and looking at stuff on the ground, well, that's not work. That's a hobby. You enjoy doing it. It's nice time outside walking around. There's a bunch of mushrooms. You take them home. You didn't have to plant those mushrooms. You didn't have to water those mushrooms and weed the mushroom patch. You didn't have to go and, and get some amendment to put in your soil to prepare those mushrooms. There they were. You were hiking. You enjoyed it. And now you're eating delicious mushrooms. If you enjoy hunting, uh, you know, let's give another example, squirrel hunting. I knew a guy back in Connecticut who had a corn, he had a, a bird feeder filled with corn. All year long the squirrels would come and they'd eat the corn and they'd get big and fat. And when squirrel season opened up, out came the 22. <coughs> Excuse me, I had to cough so it just worked for the shot. Boom. And the squirrels, because they were feeding on the corn all year long, they got big and fat. And he had these nice, big, fat squirrels. he just shoot them out the window of his house. He enjoyed shooting, you know, a 22. It was just nice, relaxing. And boom, boom, he'd get a couple big, fat squirrels in the freezer, make some squirrel chowder. He didn't, even though he was putting the corn out for the squirrels, he wasn't, like, feeding them all their feed. He wasn't cleaning up their poop. He didn't have to fix fencing for the squirrels or worry about predation. He just opened up his window opening day on a Saturday morning with the sun shining and shot whatever squirrels walked by and he enjoyed himself. There is so much natural food, whether it's meat or plants out there and you can enjoy harvesting it without doing any of the work. That is asymmetrical warfare. The time and effort we put into the goats, the time and effort we put into the cows, the time and effort we put into the chickens, we're fortunate if we get that same value back. Some people put more time and effort in and get less out. That happens all the time with homesteading. If it's a hobby, if you enjoy it, that's fine. But if you want to just get really good quality food, enjoy every minute of it, not clean up poop, not build fences, not sweat it out on a hot summer day, and just enjoy the, being outside in the cool fall weather or you know spring weather, whatever it is, more and more people should take advantage of hunting fishing and foraging. And that's why we do cover so much of that on this channel and in our podcast. We looked hard at foraging. We interviewed my friend, The Foraging Beard on Instagram. Uh, that's Jared, go check out The Foraging Beard. We interviewed him on an episode of Home Study about foraging. Jared talked about going out and finding morel mushrooms. He talked about chanterelles, a lot of different good mushrooms. Check out that episode, we'll have links below for that podcast. Accounted Mike gave foraging a thumbs down. He said it's hard to put in the time and get back what you put in. But again, if it's a hobby and you just like walking in the woods, who cares what Accountant Mike says? Go out, walk in the woods, and take home whatever you find. And if you don't find anything, you went on a hike. And that's great. We looked at fishing. Accountant Mike gave fishing a thumbs up. If you know a good spot, if you know you can limit out opening morning, go with your kids, load up. Uh, yeah, fishing is a great way to put a bunch of meat in the freezer. And again, if it's a bad spot and it doesn't go well, you still got to go fishing. So you know what they say about a bad day of fishing? Hunting. Hunting, especially gun hunting, can be extremely profitable. The time spent out there, the money spent on that, versus what you get back. There's so much good things 
in the natural land and public lands are open to everyone. There may be rules about foraging that apply to certain public lands, so don't just go to a park and start picking wild onions thinking that you're okay. You gotta make sure it's okay to forage where you're going. But you can hunt on public land all across the United States. And again, I know there's worldwide viewers. We can't speak for the whole world. I don't know how the whole world works. But across the United States, there's lots of public land that you can hunt, there's public waters you can fish, and there's public land you can forage. You can get incredible bounty. Firewood, firewood, Simple Man talked about being a huge savings. We did an episode on the podcast about firewood. We figured out every year I was saving about $2,000 in heating, heating our house in Connecticut with firewood. So you can definitely save money. You can probably save a lot more than that, but at the time we were doing a combination of firewood and wood pellets, so we weren't completely on firewood. If you like doing fire, firewood's a lot of work, and you can spend a ton of time and energy cutting and getting that wood. But if you enjoy being outside, you enjoy doing that. There's even public lands where you can get firewood. There are certain times that certain states will open up a section, say, come and get the, the trees here. Gotta check, you can't just go cutting down trees on public land. But again, a way to profit from the natural land. How much do we do? Well, we focus here at Homesteady. I do most of mine is hunting and fishing. I'm not a very confident forager, but now that we live in Pennsylvania, there's a lot more morel mushrooms, chanterelles. There's a lot better mushroom foraging spots in Pennsylvania, and I'm not too far away from my friend Jared, the foraging beard. So this upcoming spring, I'm definitely planning on getting out in those foraging woods, and I'm gonna see if I can get Jared to take me along and show me what I'm doing so I don't poison my whole family. <laughs> Another nice thing about spending time hunting, fishing, and foraging is just the mental health and the physical health aspect. Sometimes all you need to do to feel better is just go for a walk. I, I found with our move this year, I felt lower at times, sadder having moved than I ever probably did in my life. Uh, moving is one of the hardest things you can do in your life, and we did it, we moved far away. And uh, just getting out for a walk a lot of times helped kind of lift my spirits. Let's get into another question, and I don't want to, I don't want to mudsling or throw rocks, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I did want to address this comment because I think it's important to consider these things from, you know, a couple different points of view. And Dee Dee put the hashtag Ask Home Study, so she wanted me to address this. So Dee Dee says, last week we were talking about filming and vlogging and somebody had asked the question about vlogging in public. When you're making videos for YouTube, you're walking around with the camera and there's other people around you, what is the right way to handle that? And I talked about how generally speaking in a public place, you are allowed to film without worrying about other people being in the picture. Now that's not always true, not every place, it doesn't apply, this isn't legal advice. I just was saying as a general rule of thumb, if you're in a public place where people know they're in a public place, generally speaking, you can capture their image and publish that image. You can't always use it for commercial use, uh, but like if you're taking a picture for the newspaper and there's a bunch of people around in a public space, they are out in public, they have sacrificed their privacy to be there, and so they are not assuming that they're gonna be in private. It doesn't apply to what they say, so the audio, People can be in a public park having a private conversation, and there are certain laws in certain states that protect that. But just as a general rule, if you're walking around filming yourself and other people show up, or you're taking a, a you know, filming like a park or something, generally speaking, it's okay to use that video. And you don't have to ask permission, you don't have to blur the people. So Dee Dee said it's a shame that nobody has any privacy because of inconsiderate bloggers. Just because I have to go out in public in order to buy groceries, that doesn't mean you have the right to film me. You should be required to cover people's faces in your videos, especially children. And then Dee Dee put the hashtag Ask Home Study. So they definitely wanted me to acknowledge this, to read this, and I thought it was a good thing to address. If I'm gonna give advice on the channel, 
telling somebody that they can go in public and film, I should be able to defend that within a reasonable, I'm not trying to cause an argument with Didi. Uh, I just wanted to approach that point and, and explain why I think that maybe it's worth a, a reconsidering that stance. So first off, Didi said, it's a shame that nobody has any privacy because of inconsiderate bloggers. So I don't agree with that statement, Didi. You have absolute the right to privacy in the privacy of your home, in the privacy of your workplace. The things that you own that are yours, you deserve privacy there. And I 100% agree to that. I believe that within the Constitution of the United States of America, there is rights to privacy. Now, that could be argued, you know, I'm sure somebody in the comments below will argue that. Uh, but I do think you have the right to privacy. I don't want anybody showing up on my property filming me, and I would never show up on your property and film you. So you do have privacy. Inconsiderate bloggers and vloggers don't change that. You do have the right to privacy within the privacy of the places you own that are yours, or within places where you deserve privacy that are in public, like a public restroom. You can't go into a public restroom and start filming people. That is not a place where you can assume people are in public so you can film them. So there is a level of reasonableness too in public. And then Didi says, just because I have to go out in public in order to buy groceries, that doesn't mean you have a right to film me. Well, that might be true depending on where you shop. A store, a business has the right, if they own that ground or that they're leasing that ground, they have the right to put up a sign that says no filming in this premise. And if there's a sign that says no filming in this store, a vlogger better, or a blogger, whatever you're doing, you better respect that. Because if you go beyond that, you are now in trouble. And I would never suggest that a vlogger go into a store where it says no filming and turn on a camera. But the point is, the owners of that store have the right, the people leasing that space or who own that space, it's theirs to say whether or not because it's their space. And guess what? Most of them are running 24 hour surveillance. You're on video every minute you're walking around that store. So whether or not you like the idea of being on video shopping at the grocery store, you probably are on video shopping at the grocery store. It's going, and you're on video the minute you walk outside because outside there are satellites that are videoing. Google Earth is constantly watching. There is video all over the place. So the places you have the right to privacy that you're in control of is your, your own personal property, your own personal spaces, spaces you're leasing. If you have a store, that you own, you can put up a sign that says no cameras and you deserve that right. You can protect that, you can enforce that. Now, the next, the real reason I, uh, I brought this up uh, is because of the next thing that Didi says. She said, or they said, you should be required to cover people's faces in your videos, especially children. So who would require that? Who would make that requirement? Well, obviously, if it's going to be a requirement that's enforced in public, the only people that can make rules that can be enforced in public is the government. And so what you're saying is the government should regulate the ability to take video, to take pictures, to create media in public spaces. The First Amendment, we live in the United States of America. The Constitution is supposedly the rules that run that thing, <laughs> that is the United States. And the First Amendment Freedom of religion, speech, and the press says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So let's zoom in on that. The First Amendment says that the government cannot make a law that would limit freedom of speech of the press. So when we think about, and obviously, I'm not saying that this is right or wrong, this is my opinion on what that means. <laughs> the fact that people can argue their opinion of the Constitution of the United States of America, I mean, that gives a lot of news 
broadcasting platforms a lot of airtime, people arguing over what it means. But when I read that, what I see is that the government should not be making laws that limits the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. And when we think about the press, although they did not have loggers when they made the Constitution of the United States, uh, the point of the press was to be able, it was really, I mean, a, a check and balance to the government itself. People were able to hear news, what was going on, who was doing what, and the government was not allowed to make laws that limited that, that essentially would create a, a biased media that the government was running. Now, you could obviously say lots of the media we see today is biased. Probably 90%, 99% of the media created is biased. I create media that is biased. I think homesteading is great. I think you should homestead. So the media that I produce is obviously slanted towards telling people like you, hey, you should be able to have your own piece of property and do what you want on it and feed your family and all that stuff. So, but, but the big picture here is that the government should not make laws that limits the press. And in our day and age, the press, the media that is being produced includes videos being made on YouTube. That is media. That is part of what the press is. The press is not a professional news broadcaster. They're not the only people who can create media or press. If you write a blog, that's the new media. If you make a YouTube channel, that's the new media. And whether or not you like the idea of people who are making a YouTube channel filming in public, if you make a law that limits them filming in public, the next easy step is to make laws that limit the people of the press. Because where is the line in a news broadcaster and a YouTube broadcaster? Where do you say, well, oh, this guy's a reporter for NBC, so his opinion is more important, his media is more important, what he's producing is more important. Uh, this guy on YouTube, he's just doing it himself, so he's not as important. Well, his 70,000 subscribers probably would disagree with you. His 70,000 subscribers probably care more about what's being made on YouTube than the garbage being made on the nightly news. Personal opinion there. The point is, we live in the United States of America. The Constitution is supposed to be the rule book we're all going by. And the First Amendment talks about the government should not make rules that limits the press, the media that is being created. There are countries out there where they have very strict press laws, very strict about what media can be created. <laughs> I'm sure it's hard to be a vlogger in North Korea, <laughs> but it's not my opinion that there should be that the government should have anything to do with making rules about what videos I can make in public or what videos you can make in public or what videos NBC can make in public, Fox News can make in public. When it comes to the in public, which Didi admittedly mentioned, they go in public when they go grocery shopping. They, they leave the privacy of their home to be in public. Once we're in the public forum, we understand while you might walk around naked in your own house, you're not going to walk around naked in the grocery store because you are now in public. And so in the public realm, there should be no laws that are limiting videos that can be taken. It's my opinion. I'm just talking about it because you put the hashtag in there and I thought it was a good thing to bring up the other side of the story. You may disagree with me. It's totally okay to disagree. Two educated people can make educated decisions that are completely different. And you personally watching might feel, no, I, I wish the government would make a law that said you can't film anything in public. But I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea to let the government make laws about the videos, the filming, the media, the press that can be made in the public forum. And that's why when I tell somebody who wants to start a vlog, hey, you're gonna go in public, you're gonna go to the farmer's market, you're gonna go to the public park and go foraging and you're rolling your camera and somebody walks behind you, it's okay. You have to look into your own actual laws and the rules of the place you're going, but as a general guideline, that's okay. That's why I suggest, that's why I take that approach when giving advice. So I hope that clears some things up, explains my stance on 
vlogging and filming in public. Fun little discussion about the First Amendment. Let's get on to the next question. As long as we're making content, media, whether it's in private or in public, we might as well make good stuff, right? Mickey's Oasis asks, what is the best uh, way to vlog about gardening is what I believe Mickey was asking. I'm trying to get a channel going, but I am not sure if the content I am making is any good. I live in a desert climate and I want to share how I prepare beds and keep things alive in 115 plus weather, degree weather. How do I make my content more enjoyable slash engaging? Great question, Mickey. I think it's Mickey or M Mickey. I'm going to say Mickey, M-I-K-I, Mickey. Sorry if I got it wrong, Mickey. So I actually took a look at your channel. And right now, whoever's watching, go check out Mickey's Oasis because she's got potential to be a very cool channel. She's homesteading or gardening, whatever you want to call it. Farming, whatever word you want to use, Mickey, uh, in very hot climate, very arid climate, looked like sandy, dusty, hot. And one of the videos that I watched, she was preparing some lights in like a, a trellis patio thing so that she could garden at night, which is such a good idea. If you're going to garden when, it, when it's hot out, why not do that at night? That way you're not out in the hot sun. And that was the point she made in her video. So go check out Mickey's Oasis, M-I-K-I -I Oasis. M-I-K-I-S, Oasis. Uh, good on you for starting this channel, Mickey. It, sometimes we, we have an idea and we sit on it and we plan, and we come up with a logo and, and a website and then we just never do it because we're just like, oh man, I gotta be perfect. So great job on starting. Good start, got the camera out there, you're filming stuff. So way to go, you got started. You have very few subscribers. Let's make it a goal of People, go check out Mickey's Oasis. Let's get her to 50 subscribers. If you are watching this video, type in Mickey's Oasis in YouTube, find her channel, hit subscribe. It's gonna be homesteading like gardening stuff. So if you're into that, check it out. Hopefully we can get you to 50 subscribers, Mickey, I hope. Uh, and now that you're gonna have those new subscribers, I sent you some new subscribers, make them some good, some great content. So let's talk about how you can make great content more enjoyable and more engaging. So the first, I'm gonna give you three kind of rules before you make a video, and then I'm gonna break down what I saw in the video that I watched. I watched a couple of your videos, but we'll talk about the one where you did the lighting. So first off, rule number one, when you're gonna make a, a vlog, if you're gonna do regular videos, and it looks like that's what you're planning because you're starting to release them more regularly, plan. I made the mistake when I first started this YouTube channel of being outside and thinking I should do a video right now and like turning on the camera. And if you don't plan, you know what they say about planning, right? The ship that doesn't plan where it's going is just gonna be lost at sea because they don't have a destination in mind. So while it might be fun to watch a ship lost at sea, it's not fun for the guy on the ship and that's you. So when you go outside, before you go outside to do your, your vlog, think ahead of time, plan the vlog out. Me and Kay sit down every Monday morning over coffee and we say, what are we doing this week? What's happening? Where are we going? What things are we gonna do? What videos should we make? Am I gonna make a video this day? Uh, this day we're gonna do that. We've done a lot of videos on that. How can we make it different? A little bit of time planning at the beginning of the week. If you're making one a month at the beginning of the month, if you're making one a week at the beginning of the week, if you're making daily, sit down and plan five out. You know, plan seven out. Things will still happen. One day you'll come out and there'll be a raccoon eating a carrot in your desert garden and you'll be like, you, you know, whip out a pistol and shoot the raccoon and that'll make a great video. My camera battery just died. Don't know where that cut me off. Probably was for the best. I was talking about shooting a raccoon and that making a good video. And yeah, maybe that wouldn't be a great idea. But anyway, the point is stuff will happen. Videos that you don't plan will spring up and you can take advantage of that when it happens. But if you have an everyday routine day on the homestead, try to plan ahead to make that video more enjoyable. Now, what should you plan when you're planning that video? Let's get to rule number two. Uh, follow a story arc. And 
what that really means is when you're creating content, you see this on the news a lot, uh, make a mountain out of a molehill. What do I mean by that? Well, every day on the homestead is not fascinating, right? Every day on the homestead, you don't do things that are incredibly engaging and incredibly interesting and have a, a ton of drama. But that doesn't mean your blogs or your vlogs have to be like, let's make a mountain, right? Let's make a story arc. So when you have a problem to fix on the homestead, that story arc, present us with the problem in the beginning. Let us know something's wrong. And you could be pretty melodramatic about it. You could come out and say like, for example, with the video where you're setting up lights, uh, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more, but uh, Mickey was making a video where she was putting twinkle lights on a trellis, or on a uh, awning kind of thing, because she wanted to have some light at night so she could garden at night because it's too hot where she lives to garden during the day and she's trying to create this beautiful oasis. So you come outside and you could say, today we're gonna put some lights up because I wanna garden at night because it's hot in the day. Or you can come out and say, oh man, it is another scorcher. I didn't get where you lived, Mickey, from your video. I'm gonna say like Arizona because I know that's a hot place. Oh man, it's another scorcher in Arizona. And then on comes a clip of the news and they're like, today it's going to be 130 degrees in Arizona. Human beings will melt. And then it cuts back to you and you're like sipping a lemonade like I don't want to do anything. And that's why I'm gardening at nighttime. But I can't garden in the dark. And then you roll a clip of like, it's all dark and it's just your eyes and you're like, oh man. And there's crickets. Deep, 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 deep. And you're making a mountain out of a molehill, right? Okay, it's hot, you don't wanna garden the heat. We could be real flatline about this. Or we can get people amped and excited and just, this is a big deal to you. While we might not care that you garden in the heat, you're done gardening in the heat. You're gonna garden at night. It's gonna be cooler out. You're gonna have your twinkle lights. It's gonna be magical. Get us excited. Get us concerned for you. Make us feel how you feel. And even more so. And I do this in our videos and sometimes it gets me kicked in the butt I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but the point is, you know, fan the f fire. B fan those flames. Whew, get us excited. Now we have our problem. Now let's go through the building process and things are, you're doing stuff and you're up on the ladder and you're tch -tch -tch with the nail gun. And when you're working, stuff goes wrong, right? Reality TV, you, you wonder if they don't like half the time make stuff go wrong because it's engaging. It keeps you, you know, to the next clip it keeps you to the next commercial so I'm not saying make stuff up but while you're working if something happens highlight it you know if you make a mistake point it out and be like oh man here I go again silly Mickey I made a mistake I always do this wrong oh, a little bit of personality something went wrong or if something goes right be like Bzz, nailed it did it great and here's why you know just highlight more things uh, we're working through it and then the victory at the end, right? You're done. And you did this in your video about the trellis. At night, you showed us that, that money shot at the end where the lights were on and you were happy. And that was great. So just amp it up in the beginning a little bit more, unsettle us, get us worried for you, wanting to stick around to see the victory in the end. And that story arc can help you a lot. So plan that. You're cleaning the barn today. You don't have a barn, but that's what we do. We're cleaning the barn. We do this all the time. Nobody wants to watch another barn cleaning video unless we let you know at the beginning of the video, oh man, today we're getting a big shipment and we gotta be ready for it. And then you see us working and it's time lapse and it's quick. And then you see the truck coming and oh, we gotta, we gotta beat the truck. It, it just creates more of a story that engages more people, keeps more people interested. Now this can get you into trouble. This is, gets me into trouble sometimes because making a mountain out of a molehill. One of my most popular videos right now, and you never know which ones are gonna get real popular or viral. Um, I call it my warning to all of you before you start homesteading. We had just moved. We had just arrived to our new homestead here in Pennsylvania, and I couldn't find tools anywhere. I couldn't find the boxes with the tools. I didn't know where the screws were. I didn't know where anything was. I was flustered and overwhelmed by moving. 
and here we are at our new homestead and I had these two stupid problems like a, a latch on a door wasn't working and then a waterer wasn't working and they were very small problems but I was making my video for the day and I was feeling like just worn out from moving and flustered and the video I'm like talking about like oh man I can't find any of my stuff the warning was before you move to your homestead or when you first start homesteading don't have animals because then you have these problems to fix while you're trying to get settled a lot of that video went really viral it's got a more than a hundred thousand two hundred thousand views it's got a lot of views it's one of our most popular videos in it I'm very negative that day most of the people who see that video don't know that we had a homestead for seven years. I know how to fix latches. I know how to water animals. Most people see that as this guy moved from the city to a new farm and he's getting his butt kicked by the farm and he's a big crybaby. And I get hammered in the comments section. People call me all kinds of stuff, tell me to go back to the city and whatever. Don't matter. It's one of my most popular videos. I'm making a killing. <laughs> I'm not making a killing, but in YouTube video terms, I'm making a lot of money off that video. It's popular. I made a mountain out of a molehill. In that particular video, I looked like a bit of a, like, this guy's over his head, in over his head. Am I really in over my head having to fix the latch? No, I did it the next day, the problem's gone, and we moved on. And in that video, I, you know, don't look great. But I made a mountain out of a molehill. Once in a while, you got to be balanced about how dramatic you're going to be, how much you're going to do, you know, you don't want to be ridiculous because that's what will happen. And it just turned out to be one of our more popular videos. So it is what it is. At least I'm making some money from it, which is a good thing. Do I want to look like a guy who can't handle a latch on a door? No. But I also like to be pretty honest in our videos. And the honest truth is, as you know, Mickey, some days on the homestead are hard. Even if the job isn't hard, you're just not there that day. Maybe you just moved to a brand new homestead and you're feeling super overwhelmed by moving. And I like to let people know that that's real. And that's another good rule that I didn't even have on my list, but I'm gonna throw it in there. While you wanna plan, while you wanna make a story arc, be honest, be real. I really was flustered that day. I really was feeling bad. I had just moved away from my home of 30 years and I didn't even know where there was like a screwdriver or a screw gun, which, you know, now I know where it is. But that day I didn't and I really felt that way. I wasn't making it up. So while I want you to plan and think about a story arc and make a mountain out of a molehill to be interesting, be, be real. Don't make stuff up because what happens if, if you're always yourself if you're always real, you'll never get caught being fake, right? I am very real on this channel. I am openly honest about stuff that if I was trying to be macho manly, I wouldn't be. I get made fun of all the time by the macho men watching our videos because I don't like to milk cows. I don't like to milk cows. My grandfather left the dairy farm that his family owned, which if he hadn't, I probably would own like a 300 acre farm in northern Vermont, which would be sweet, but he left it to join the military because he didn't want to milk cows. Is my grandfather a sissy because he doesn't want to milk cows every day? No. Am I a wuss or a sissy because I don't want to milk cows every day? No. I am not afraid to honestly say like that's not for me. I like working with pigs. I like working with chickens. I like homesteading. I like hunting. I like fishing. All that stuff has a ton of work associated with it. Just because I don't want to milk cows every day doesn't mean I'm like some wuss from the city who doesn't belong here. So I'm open and honest about it because I want every, all my viewers to know it's okay not to do everything on the homestead. You don't have to milk cows to be a homesteader. You can raise pigs and never milk a thing because you don't milk pigs. Raise your pigs, raise your chickens. You ain't gonna milk them either. Those are the things I'm into. If I faked it like I was, one of these days you'd see a video where I didn't milk a cow and Kay didn't milk a cow and you'd be like, oh, why didn't you milk a cow? And I'd be like, well, because I don't really like it. And then you get caught up in stuff. So bonus rule, be honest, be yourself. While you want to have good, engaging content, don't fake stuff. Keep it real. Just keep it interesting and let us know what you're feeling, which a lot of times to come across through a camera, you have to be just emphatic with how you feel. You might be bummed, and some people when they're bummed are like, hmm, I'm bummed. But that doesn't come across on the camera. So just be like, oh man, I'm bummed. Just so we know you're bummed. Or like, hey, I'm great. 
but that way we know you're great. Okay. Now let's go through your video a little bit more. Um, this is more like just that particular video. So everyone go watch Mickey's video about setting up the lights on that trellis. The beginning, again, mountain out of a molehill. You told us what you were going to do, but let us feel why. Today, I'm it's really hot where I live, and uh, so we're going to set up some lights so I can do it in the dark. But amp that up. Let us know why, because I don't live in Arizona. I can't relate, or wherever you live. I don't live there. I can't relate to that kind of heat. But I do know how it feels on a hot summer day when it's real hot out. I don't want to work outside. So help me remember that. Be like, oh man, it is hot out today. Look at the perspiration. Now, maybe that's not your style to be super amped like I get, and that's okay. Be you, but just let us know. So if you're a little bit more mellow, which watching a couple of videos, it seems like you're definitely a more mellow person than me. That's all right. So is Kay. She's much more soft-spoken and mellow, but you can still let us know in your own mellow way whichever that is, that it's hot out. You know, you got those sunglasses, throw them sunglasses on and be like, everybody, it's hot today. And then like the shot of like sweat, but maybe you don't want to show you sweat, so maybe like you got a cold drink. Whatever your style is, just, just illustrate it and emphasize it more for us so we know what you're doing and why. We get into your work and you started working and you did the fast motion thing, which is a great way to get people feeling like we're going to see stuff in this video. Move the camera a few more times. One fast motion clip for like a minute is too boring for your viewers. So to get a video more engaging, move that camera. Fast motion from this angle, fast motion from this angle, fast motion from this angle. Put some music to it. If you can't afford to pay for royalty free music, that's okay. You can get a lot of free music. Even YouTube provides free music that you can use. Find some free music that you can put to that stuff because fast motion is fun, but without a little music, it's kind of a dead spot in the video. More of you, more of your smile and face. So when you started working in that video, it was you and then work, 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 fast motion, fast motion, fast motion, and then like done. And I think there might have been one scene where you were pointing at stuff and talking, but don't ever do that. People connect with people. So whenever you can, as often as you can, put that camera back on your smiling face, glasses on, whatever it is, look at the camera, smile and talk to us. Let us get connected with you. Tell a bit more of your story. Do that in between the beginning and the end. Don't have it be start you and then all camera of you working and then end. Interrupt once in a while to tell us a bit more of the story. Keep us entertained, keep us involved, keep us connected. And one little bonus tip with that, look at the lens. It happens to beginners, it happened to me, people had to tell me this. If you have a camera with the flip screen, you're looking over here. You're like, hey, hey guys, today we're doing a video. Mm -mm. Hide that flip screen if you have to. Look at the camera lens. Because when people are watching your videos, if you look at the camera lens, it's like you're talking to them. If you look at the camera lens, you can make eye contact through that camera lens. If you're looking to the side, you lose that connection. It's all right. I did it in the beginning too. From time to time, you'll still catch me looking quickly to the side to make sure I'm in shot. But just try to, as much as possible, look at the lens. And then uh, finally, add a little bit more of your story to the videos and you and your personality. Again, if you're more mellow than me, you don't have to be like Johnny YouTube. What's up, everybody? I'm super amped. That's okay. If your style is calm and mellow, that's awesome. That's Kay. People love the videos Kay's in because she's calm. She's reserved, but she's well-spoken and she can, she's smart. She's engaging. When Kay talks, even though it's quieter, and it's more subdued than I am, it gets people to listen. And I'm like trying to do that thing right now, but it's, it's not me. So do what you do, but, but make sure there's personality in there. Make sure there's your story. I noticed in some of your videos you have parakeets. Uh, you have a dog. What's their names? What are they doing? Take a minute to know your dog. You showed in one of your videos you were feeding your parakeets some of the plants you grew. What's, who are those parakeets? Let us connect with them. What are their names? You know, yellow and, and gray over there, like, what do I do with my food? I feed it to my birds. 
little yellow over here is stubborn. It, he never eats it, but, but gray likes it. So, you know, we'll forget yellow. We'll do this for gray. And then a close up on yellow, like, eh, I'm a stubborn parakeet because all parakeets are stubborn. Gray's just a little bit better. You get the idea. Bring it all to life. That dog that's standing there looking out, everybody on this channel knows my dog's names because I love my dogs and I want you to love them too. Bones. He's like, that's my, my man's best friend. Let me know what's your dog's name. Get a shot of him. It's your oasis, but your dog probably likes it too. So, so pull all that out. Keep it, keep it up. You've started here. You got some traction. Keep going. I don't want any of this advice to get you feeling like overwhelmed or frustrated. I threw a lot at you because, you know, you can take this and over the next year, every month, work on one part of it or one piece of it. And that's the final bit of advice is just keep making videos. The more videos you make, the better you're going to be. I only got to where I am because I've made like 700 videos. So after you've made seven, which is I think where you're at right now, uh, my first seven videos are not great. You're better off than my first seven. <laughs> my first seven, I, I, we won't even go there. Don't watch them. So just keep going, just keep getting better and you'll get to the point and hopefully we'll get you some new subscribers here so you can make that good content about your oasis, your parakeets, your dog there and everything that's going on. Keep going, you're doing good. Uh, it's worth doing. I love having a YouTube channel. I love making videos and if you like doing it, it's worth doing. Just, yep, I've talked a lot about making content but that's good rules for everybody. So let's get to, I got like two more quick questions here. I talked about in another video this week where you'll see kind of that story arc. I talked about the mud problem that we were having. Um, I started that video off, we were getting a ton of mud. Uh, the rain, it's been unseasonably wet in Pennsylvania this year and our livestock are just turning this place into a, a mud pit. And that's a perfect example of what we just talked about, making a mountain out of a molehill. I could have come on camera and been like, Hey everybody, this week uh, it's very muddy in our stalls and so we're going to try to solve the mud problem with these three solutions. But made a mountain out of a molehill showed you like, first off I came out saying we're getting rid of all our animals because there's too much mud. It was a joke. We're not getting rid of all our animals. Some people didn't get the joke, but that's okay because it made for a more engaging video. I showed you the problem too much mud. And then I talked about three solutions. And hopefully, because you were engaged in the beginning with the problem, you stuck around to hear the three solutions because ultimately one day you might face a muddy pasture. Certainly Mickey won't in the uh, oasis there. But you watching might one day and I want to help you. Ultimately, that's why I'm making these videos is so we can inspire, help you get through problems, help you have some solutions, all that stuff. So, one of our questions was about one of our solutions for the mud. Um, poor Brenda has had some really bad mud problems. She lost two eight-month-old beef calves because of issues having uh, way too muddy pastures and things. And I did mention in that video it can be bad for your livestock. So she asked a couple questions and I'm only going to focus on the one Actually, I'll cover two of them. First, Brenda wanted to know more about the geotextile fabric. So in that video, I talked about one of the solutions to muddy paddocks is to remove all that nasty mud, put down geotextile fabric, and then put on top of the fabric gravel. She's like, I've never heard of that. Is that even a real thing? What's the deal with geotextile fabric? She wanted to know more. So I figured I'd just explain a bit more real quick they, this fabric comes in long rolls. The biggest I've heard of is 12 foot rolls. You roll it out like a rolling out of a carpet over a sub layer of your soil. Not the organic uh, nasty mud stuff. You remove that. You find a harder, better draining soil underneath that. Roll this fabric out on, on it and then you put gravel on top of that. And the reason why is the fabric keeps the gravel from sinking into the subsoil. You put a bunch of gravel, anyone who's done this knows, you put a bunch of gravel on like dirt and then you add rain and animal poop and hoofs pushing it and eventually all the gravel you've added 
works down into the soil and it's like the $500 of gravel you put down is gone. The fabric, you put the gravel on top and when it gets pushed down, the fabric keeps it from going down through. You have to get a good quality fabric and you want to get something that's water permeable. You want the water to get through it and into that subsoil which is better draining than the organic stuff up top. So you're looking for a non-woven geotextile fabric. I don't have a specific brand yet. I haven't purchased it. I know enough about it. We've used it in the past. I used to be an excavator. I used to do this for a living, drainage and stuff. So I used a lot back then. But I don't have a go-to brand because honestly, it was my dad making the purchases. I was just putting the stuff in. And I don't remember the brand we had purchased. And I also wasn't purchasing that for livestock. I want to make sure when I pick the brand we use, it's actually for agriculture. The stuff we were doing was like basement drainage and septic systems and stuff. So uh, agricultural use might be a little different. When I have a good brand and I'm installing it, I will definitely show it on this channel. You will see it if we do it. Just got to figure out how much it's going to cost me and I haven't gotten that far yet in the planning and in the project. But that's the deal with the geotextile fabric. That's what it's for. And it is very highly recommended as a solution for muddy paddocks. Lots of, uh, all the information I found on it was from um, extension agents. Check out your local extension agent, the NCRS, National Center for Resource, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's different government organizations that help agriculture, farmers. They, this was their go-to solution for muddy problems so check that out and the other question that you asked Brenda was would a roof behind your barn help you putting up a roof with then just some six yes and no a roof would but you still have to clean out wherever cows are in a big area all the time you still have to clean that out and so then you still have to like get a tractor in there to clean it or some machine it, and, and then you're building a roof and a structure. And in my opinion, it would just be simpler to do the gravel, the geotextile. I was an excavator. I can run these machines. I can install this all myself. I am not a carpenter. I'm not good at building roof structures. For that, I would need to bring in help. And that help means either more money or you know, friends and family helping, which is nice too. But I'd rather just do something I can do that I know how to do right. So good questions, Brenda. Hope you get your mud problem solved. And we have one more question. Actually, two more, but this one's a second. <laughs> Malachi wanted to know how long and wide the barn is. And so many people have asked this. I've never measured the barn, so I never had an answer. I measured the barn because we're looking to do gutters for the barn. So our barn is 32 wide by 36 long. If you like our barn and you want to build something similar, those are our barn's dimensions. Finally, one more <clears throat> question because I'm losing my voice here. This I thought was something that a lot of homesteaders will find, especially if you move on to your homestead and you haven't planned ahead. Uh, Kelly wanted to know, how do I recommend getting water in a barn? They have a barn with a concrete floor that's close to the house, but they don't have water in it. And they've been carrying buckets of water twice daily for eight years now. Would love to have water in the barn. Kelly, oh man. I would have quit so long ago if I was hauling buckets to the barn for eight years. Not afraid to admit, I don't want to be carrying buckets every day to my barn. I like to work smart, not hard. And putting water in your barn is a smart move. Let me tell you how you can do it, Kelly. So you don't have to work hard and you can work smart. It's a bit of an ordeal, but it's so worth it. What you're gonna do, and this is what we had to do at Squash Hollow because our barn already existed at Squash Hollow and it did not have water or electric. So what we did, starting at our house, we used a machine, an excavator, but you could do it by hand if you don't know how to run an excavator or you don't wanna hire someone. Uh, you're probably gonna need an excavator or at least a trencher for this job though. So consider either learning how to use one, getting someone you know to do it. Uh, dig down along the side of your house to the foundation. Down so that you're at the elevation. If your house has a basement, wherever the water is in your basement, dig down. All right. Here we go. Here's your wall. Here's where your water is in the basement with a pipe like right here. Dig down on the outside of your house 
drill a hole through your basement, run through that hole, you're going to run this black pipe. You get it from Home Depot or whatever big box store you choose. It's a big roll of black, like poly pipe. Inside the house, they use what's called PEX. Uh, this is a little different from that. It's made for outdoor use. Get the higher PSI. They make like a 120 and like a 160. I would get the 160 in case you drop a rock on it or something, you don't want a hole. It comes in a big roll, big black roll. Go to Home Depot, ask them for it. They'll be able to point you in the right direction. That big black roll of outdoor pipe, you run that through the hole in your foundation that you just put. Make sure not to put this hole if you have any water problems, like water coming off a hill and hitting your house, because water will go through that if it's near water issues. So put it on the side of your house where you don't have any water. Maybe it's sloped away. So you dig down, you run that pipe through. You have on the inside of your house, either you or a plumber connects that pipe to your existing water line. Put a shutoff valve on it inside the house. Then that roll of pipe, it's all one roll. It's not PVC that you like glue and connect. It's one roll. You unroll that spool into a trench. So now, there's our wall. You dig a trench out to your barn here. So here's our barn. Dig your trench from the house to the barn. Unroll, you said it's close. So one roll of this stuff is like 100 feet. You'll probably maybe even get a 50 foot roll because if it's close, you won't need much. If it's really close, you could do this with PVC pipe, but you know, I don't know how close it is. So it might be better to just get this roll of stuff. If it's really close, you could do this with like a, a two inch PVC line or something. Anyway, you run that, you trench it down to where your barn is. Now you have a trench running right to your barn. You said you have a concrete floor. You're gonna need to get a big handheld concrete saw. They are a backbreaker to use, but again, it's gonna be worth it. Uh, you could run it inside with a concrete saw. Cut the concrete, pull it out, continue your trench and right inside the barn. As a second option, forget the concrete saw, go around your barn, trench to the side of it. Where are your animals? Are they in the back? Then trench right to the back corner where the animals are, where the water needs to be, or again, trench inside with the concrete saw, cut the concrete, pull it out, and then dig it down with a shovel. <clears throat> Unroll the spool to your end point. You're gonna then cut that spool. You're going to put a barb. They, they have these little plastic barbs that go into the plastic pipe. You might have to heat it with a little blowtorch, like a chicken cooker, we call them, uh, to loosen it up. I wish I'd made a video of this back when we were doing this at our homestead. You put the barb in there, and then the other end of the barb goes into a frost-free hydrant. Chances are your frost-free hydrant uh, ends with, actually they might come already with an elbow, the frost-free hydrant, an elbow with a barb that you could go right onto. Uh, put a frost-free hydrant down in the bottom of your trench. You wanna be down deeper than your frost line. So if you, where you live, the frost line is at a foot, dig down a foot and a half. If the frost line is four feet, go down four feet and a half, wherever it is, get a long frost-free hydrant sticking up above the ground. And the way a frost-free hydrant works, if this is the ground, kind of helps to have all this stuff lying around, your frost-free hydrant works like this. Down below the ground is where the water drains to. You turn it on and off up here. When you turn it off, water drains back down the hydrant below the ground where there's no frost, it's not frozen, and then it actually drips out. The frost-free hydrant will have a little tube that allows it to drip out of it into the soil. So I like to bury my frost-free hydrant in a lot of gravel so it can absorb that little bit of water that's draining out. Up top is a spout that you can hook up a hose to in the summertime, or in the winter, you can just hang a bucket on that spout, turn on your water, Boom, water comes into the bucket, turn off your frost rehydrant, and now you carry the bucket one step over to where your water troughs are. Or if it's close enough, you run just a little short hose from the frost rehydrant down to your water trough, that's even better. And then when you shut it off, it drains out and you're golden. The only thing you have to remember to do with frost rehydrants in the winter is make sure they are turned off. If you were to put a hose attachment on them in the winter, 
even a short one, but leave the frost rehydrant on, the water then is up above the ground and then it can freeze and that's where you get into trouble. So make sure you turn it off, it drains down below the soil. Now you have running water year round right there to your barn. You're no longer hauling buckets. Life is good and you're gonna get more animals because you don't have to haul buckets and then you'll be mad at me because you got too many animals and life is hard again. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's how you get water to your barn. That's exactly how we did it at Squash Hollow. The barn we have here has two frost-free hydrants. Someday I will put another in and I will make a video when that happens. Unfortunately, I have never made a video. I tried one time to show water line work and sadly my camera wasn't recording when I thought it was, so. All right, another long q and I tried to keep these things short. I answered less questions, but you know me. Y'all know me, I like to talk. That's why I do these long ones. If you like our Q&As, if you're still watching after like an hour plus of me blabbing on, then consider helping us to do this show. You can do that in two ways. Become a Homesteady Pioneer, it's five bucks a month. You get bonus content, which includes classes taught by other people better at things than me. Uh, you can check that out, uh, link below to be a Homesteady Pioneer. And if you're doing any Amazon shopping, use our Amazon link below and or type in amstudy.com, it will forward you on. Or the third way to do it without spending any money, but is a huge help, is watching our videos, letting the ads play before the videos, and telling people about our channel, telling them that, hey, they can have their questions answered. They can get a personal vlog, uh, you know, what do you call that? When somebody like helps you do a thing, get, get your vlog off and running, coaching. <laughs> By the way, if any of you are working on a content-based business and you do want some coaching like what we did with Mickey there, a one-time session, regular once a month, whatever you're looking for, uh, I do help people. That's what I did before I did the YouTube channel, helped with them marketing and growing their businesses. And I would be happy to work with any of you who are working on a YouTube channel, a podcast, whatever it is. If you need some coaching, maybe a little bit of hand-holding, one hour session versus once a month session. We have rates and uh, packages put together for you know whatever your needs are. So that's something I do professionally. And if you would like some help, comment below or email me, Austin, this is home study. Say, hey, I need some coaching. And I can tell you what a, a one hour rate is and I can tell you what a once a month thing is and all that. You know, We'll come up with something that works for you. And that's, that's it for today. We're gonna shut this one down and we will see you Monday morning when our first video of the week comes out next week.